Hello everyone, this is Father Solomon from St. Louis of Assisi. Today I will be teaching the third installment of my multi-session adult faith formation series on the seven sacraments. The first session was an introduction to all the sacraments. The second session, which was posted about a month ago, uh, was on the sacraments of baptism and confirmation. And this installment, this class, will be on the Most Holy Eucharist. As with everything that we do, let's begin with prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good and gracious God, we thank you for bringing us together today, even if it is through technology. We thank you for the gift of technology that's given us the ability to stay connected during this time. We thank you for the gift of the Eucharist, the gift of your most holy body and blood. While we struggle with not receiving the Eucharist, during this particular time, we ask that we may continue to long for it, to continue to go in love for it each and every day of our lives. May we be reunited with the Most Holy Eucharist very soon. We ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So today, the objective today is to basically have a crash course on the Eucharist. Uh, there is so much theology about the Eucharist that it would not be possible uh, to cover it in just uh, one class session. So I'm going to do my best to summarize the most fundamental truths about the Eucharist. And really the objective is for us to grow in knowledge and love of this beautiful sacrament. The Catechism of the Catholic Church states that the Eucharist is the source and summit of the Christian life. The other sacraments, and indeed all ecclesiastical ministries and works of the Apostolate, are bound up with the Eucharist and are oriented to it. I would like to begin with the reflection on Scripture. I think that's the best way to get introduced uh, to really any topic of theology. So I'd like to start by reading a passage from something that's very familiar to, I think, most of us, and that is the sixth chapter of the Gospel of John, which is the Bread of Life Discourse. I'd like to read a significant portion of that chapter and then reflect upon it. So I'm starting with John chapter 6, verse 32. Jesus said to them, Amen, amen, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave the bread from heaven. My Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So they said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger, and whoever comes to me will never, whoever believes in me will never thirst. But I told you that although you have seen me, you do not believe. Everything that the Father gives me will come to me, and I will not reject anyone who comes to me, because I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of the one who sent me. And this is the will of the one who sent me, that I should not lose anything of what he gave me, but that I should raise it on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have eternal life, and I shall raise him on the last day. The Jews murmured about him, because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. And they said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph? Do we not know his father and mother? Then how can he say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered and said to them, Stop murmuring among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draw him, and I will raise him on the last day. It is written in the prophets, They shall all be taught by God. Everyone who listens to my Father and learns from him comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. And then amen, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the desert, but they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. 
The Jews quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, Amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I have life because of the Father, so also the one who feeds on me will have life because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Unlike your ancestors who ate and still die, whoever eats this bread will live forever. These things he said while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. Then many of his disciples who were listening said, This saying is hard. Who can accept it? Since Jesus knew that his disciples were murmuring about this, he said to them, Does this shock you? What if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life, while the flesh is of no avail. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. Jesus knew from the beginning the ones who would not believe and the one who would betray him. And he said, For this reason I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted to him by my Father. As a result of this, many of his disciples returned to their former way of life and no longer accompanied him. Jesus then said to the twelve, Do you also want to leave? Simon Peter answered him, Master, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and are convinced that you are the Holy One of God. One of my, that is one of my favorite gospel passages. You really can't get much more clear than this. That the Eucharist is truly the body and blood of Christ. Some people who do not believe what we believe about the Eucharist will simply say that what I just read, that Jesus was speaking not literally, but figuratively. But that would be incorrect. He was speaking literally. And how do we know this? If we look at the Greek translation of this passage, the Greek words are literal. So the word that they, Jesus, Jesus uses for flesh, the Greek translation of that word flesh, is sarx, S-A-R-X. And that word sarx means physical flesh. Another Greek word, soma, S-O-M-A, means body. But Jesus didn't use that word soma, body. He used the word sarx, physical flesh. And also, the Greek translation of the word eat in this passage is trogain, which means to gnaw or devour. The Greek translation is very literal, not just literal. The words that were chosen are very strong. Physical flesh and to gnaw or devour. So just from the Greek translation, we know that Jesus was speaking literally. But also, another reason we know that Jesus was speaking literally was that the, many of his disciples left him after this teaching. The disciples who were listening to him at that very moment knew he was speaking literally because what? They said, this saying is hard. Who can accept it? And that is why many of them stopped following Jesus after he gave this bread of life discourse. And if Jesus, for some reason, wasn't speaking literally, but figuratively, and he saw all of his disciples leave, don't you think he would have said, wait, no, come back. I was, wasn't speaking literally. But no, he let them leave him. He didn't say, come back, but then he just turned to the twelve apostles and said, do you also want to leave? Based on that Greek translation and based on the situation, that the disciples said that was a hard saying and left him. They knew at that very moment, as he was speaking to them, that he was not speaking figuratively. I'd like to now turn to 
Gospel of Luke, chapter 22. This is the Last Supper. Luke 22, verse 19. Jesus took bread, set the blessing, broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which will be given for you. Do this in memory of me. And likewise the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which will be shed for you. We all know those words very well. We hear that at every single Mass that we go to. Again, literal language. Jesus didn't say, this bread is like my body, this wine is like my bread, blood. He said, this is my body, this is my blood. And again, some people could say, well, this was like a parable. But we all know when Jesus is speaking figuratively or in parables, his language was different. Whenever we read a parable, we know, we can tell that he's just making an example to make a point. This institution there, the Last Supper, the language is very different from the other times when she spoke figuratively and or in parables. This is literal language. Because of this, for 2,000 years, the Roman Catholic Church has boldly proclaimed, professed, and taught that Jesus Christ is truly present, body, blood, soul, and divinity at the Holy Eucharist at Mass. I want to make clear that the Eucharist is not a symbol. It's not just a symbol of Christ's spiritual presence. It's not just a reminder of what he did in the past. No, the Eucharist is the body and blood of Christ. It is the body and blood of Christ. It's not a symbol. And this has been the conviction of the Catholic Church for 2,000 years that when the priest, acting in the very person of Christ, says, This is the reality. The Eucharist is the body and blood of Christ. But if the physical appearances of bread and wine are still there, how do we explain that? I want to use the philosophy of Aristotle, my philosophy professors from college would be very proud that I'm using philosophy uh, this many years later. Aristotle lived about 350 years before Jesus walked the earth. And although he was not a Christian, because Jesus hadn't even come to earth yet, Aristotle offered a physical explanation of change. His philosophical explanation of change would then later be used by St. Thomas Aquinas to explain the Eucharist. Aristotle taught that there were two kinds of change, substantial change and accidental change. In philosophy, a substance refers to what a thing is at its very core, what a thing is at its very level of being what the deepest reality of something or someone is. An accident, we're not talking about a car accident, but in philosophy, an accident is a modification of a substance. Whereas the accidents can change, but the substance will remain. For example, Hair color is an accident. Our weight is an accident. Our height is an accident. Our skin color. If I had a different color of hair, or if I had more hair, I would still be me. The deepest reality of me would be the same. If I were to gain weight during this coronavirus pandemic, 
It wouldn't change who I am. It wouldn't change the deepest reality of my being. So that's what a substance, what something is at its very core, the level of being, the deepest reality. Accidents are modifications of a substance. Accidents and substances are not two separate things, but rather a way of dividing something into something that's essential and something that's not essential. Substance is essential, accidents are non essential. The accidents are any qualities of something that have changed, as I said, do not cause the thing itself to become something else. Sorry, I lost my place here. Whereas the substance changes, the thing changes into something else, into some other type of thing. Accidents can exist without substances. Substances generally do not exist without accidents. Yeah. Substance, so, reviewing my philosophy here. Substances and created things, that's the key, key here. Substances and created things do not exist without accidental qualities. So this is when we have to understand the terminology before we can understand the philosophy of change. So when Aristotle is talking about a substantial change, He's talking about a change in the very deepest reality of something, to something's the core level of its being. Whereas when something changes substantially, it is no longer what it was before. A common example of a substantial change is when something that is living dies. That body is no longer the thing itself, but merely a deteriorating combina combination of physical features. So when an animal dies, there is substantial change because that, even though it's a dead body of an animal, it's not the animal itself anymore. This language, as complex as it may be, is key to understanding what happens with the Eucharist. In the Eucharist, there is a substantial change. Before the Eucharist is consecrated, we have bread and wine. That bread and wine has the accidental qualities of bread and wine. Looks like bread and wine, tastes like bread and wine, smells like bread and wine. But it's also bread and wine itself. It has the substance of bread and wine. That's what we call it before Mass, it's bread and wine. But after the priest says the words of consecration, something miraculous happens. While the accidental qualities of bread and wine remain, there is a substantial change going on. The substance of bread and wine is removed, and the substance of Christ's body and blood is made present there. There is a change in substances, a change in deepest reality of what that is, even though the accidental qualities remain. This is utterly unique. Accidental qualities remain while substances are changing. It's a miracle. It never happens anywhere else, except in the Eucharist. Think about that for a minute. The deepest reality, the very level of being of bread and wine, is changed into the very level of being, the deepest reality of Christ's body and blood. That's why we call what happens at Mass transubstantiation. Trans means changing substantiation of substances. It's a changing of substances. So even that word transubstantiation, which we sometimes hear, 
comes from Aristotle's philosophy over 2,000 years ago. That is why every time we come to Mass, we're witnessing a miracle every time. That substantial change with accidental qualities remaining, only divine power can do that. Only God's divine power working through the priest can make that change. The next thing I want to talk about is the Eucharist as a sacrifice. The Eucharist is not just a commemorative meal. It's not just a meal at which we are remembering the Last Supper. The Catechism, again, says, quote, Our Savior instituted the, instituted the Eucharistic sacrifice of His body and blood. This he did in order to perpetuate the sacrifice of the cross throughout the ages until he should come again. The Catechism continues, We must first and foremost understand the biblical meaning of memorial. It is not a memorial, in biblical terms, is not merely a recollection of past events, but in biblical terms, memorial means that those past events become a certain way present and real in the present moment. This is how Israel understood its liberation from Egypt. Every time Passover was celebrated, the events of the Exodus were made present to their memories. While our sins would have made it impossible for us to share in the life of God, Christ was sent to remove this obstacle. His death was a sacrifice for our sins. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Through his death and resurrection, he conquered sin and death. And the Eucharist is a memorial of that sacrifice on the cross. But not in the memorial we think about, but in that biblical sense of memorial. Which, in a certain way, makes those events of the crucifixion present to us. The church gathers to remember and to represent the sacrifice of Christ. And it's re-present. Not represents, but represents to make present again Christ's sacrifice on the cross. Through the celebration of the Eucharist, we are joined to his sacrifice on the cross and receive its benefits. It is true that Christ's crucifixion belongs to human history, for he is truly human and entered into history. However, at the same time, Christ is the second person of the Trinity, he is God himself. He was not confined to time or history. All of his actions transcend time. Jesus, as God, makes the act of the sacrifice of the cross present to us here and now at every Mass. It's not that Jesus is being crucified again and again at every Mass, but it's that one sacrifice on the cross is made present to us here and now. By the power of the Holy Spirit, His sacrifice is made present again that we may share in it. That's where we can say Christ's sacrifice on the cross and the sacrifice of the Eucharist are one sacrifice. It's the crucifixion made present now. So yes, the Eucharist is a sort of meal, but it's not just a meal. It's a sacrifice. It's the sacrifice of Christ made present to us now. That is amazing. A great thing to help us with this, to, to meditate on this, is when at Mass, the priest is elevating the body of Christ and the blood of Christ. It's a picture of Jesus hanging on the cross, right above that. To picture the blood from the cross dripping down into the chalice. To think that we are present at Calvary 
And in a Mass, even the simplest Mass, even the simplest 6.30 a.m. Mass, Christ's sacrifice on the cross is right there. The Eucharist is also a participation and an anticipation of the heavenly liturgy. At every single Mass, we are joining all of those in heaven, all of the angels and all of the saints. So imagine when you're sitting in the pews and you're participating in Mass to envision all the saints and angels gathered around you, gathered around the altar. There's so much that goes on in Mass that we can't see that's miraculous. If God were to allow us to see all that's invisible, we would be blown away. Now, a few practical things about the Eucharist that I'd like to discuss, and these will be kind of quick. A lot of people ask the question, why can only a priest consecrate the Eucharist? This question will make a little bit more sense when I do a class on the sacrament of holy order, so the priesthood. But the short answer is that when a priest is ordained, on the day of his ordination, the priest's soul is changed forever. A priest's soul is not the same as it once was before he was a priest. The soul of a priest is configured to Christ, the head of the church. The soul of a priest acts in the very person of Jesus Christ. That's why if I try to say Mass before I was a priest, there would be no Eucharist because my soul is not yet a priest. But as the priest, the priest acts in the very person of Jesus Christ. That's why he speaks in the first person during the consecration. He doesn't say, this is Jesus' body, this is Jesus' blood. He said, this is my body, this is my blood. It's because he's acting in Christ's person. So that's why the short answer of why only a priest can consecrate the Eucharist. Another question we often get is, if we just receive a very small part, small portion of the Eucharist, we don't receive the whole host, but a small crumb, or we receive the body and not the blood, or the blood and not the body, am I getting any less Jesus than I would normally? And the answer is no. There's a doctrine on this, actually, an official doctrine of the church. It's called the doctrine of concomitance. Fancy word there. Doctrine of Concomitance, which states that the whole and entire Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity, is present under both or either species, or any part of either. Let me repeat that. The whole Christ is present under both or either species, or any part of either. So if you just receive the body of Christ and not the blood, you still receive the full Christ. If you receive just the blood of Christ and not the body, this might be an example of someone who has celiac disease, they still get the full Jesus. If someone's on their deathbed and they cannot consume a whole host, but maybe just a crumb, they still receive the whole Jesus. No matter how small a part of the Eucharist we receive, or whether we receive under both or one species, we get the whole Jesus. That's why the priest and the deacons purify all the sacred vessels after Mass. Because even in the smallest crumbs, even in the smallest drop of the precious blood, the whole Jesus is there. So that's why we don't just pour it down the drain. That's why we deal with it in a special way. Because it is still Jesus, no matter how small it is. Another question people have is, why do we have a Eucharistic adoration? Why do we have an adoration chapel? Why is the Eucharist exposed in the monuments? Another doctrine, this is based on another doctrine of the church, 
This doctrine states that the true presence of Jesus in the Eucharist remains as long as the appearances of bread and wine remain. So, after Mass is over, the Eucharist, what is left of the Eucharist still remains to be Jesus. It's not like after Mass is ended, Jesus' presence just departs. As long as the Eucharist still retains the appearances of bread and the appearances of wine, the full presence of Christ is there. And so that means that when a host is left over after Mass, it is still Jesus. And so that's why we adore him as God. That's why we get the word adoration. We are adoring the presence of God in the Eucharist. The Eucharist was kept after Mass for two reasons. The first reason is that we want to be able to distribute the Eucharist to those who are sick, to those who are homebound, to those who are dying. So we reserve some of the Eucharist in the tabernacle to take the people in those circumstances. The second purpose is for Eucharistic adoration, to have a time of prayer in which we can pray in the literal presence of Jesus Christ in front of us. Some people have been asked the question, what's the difference between Jesus in the tabernacle, the Eucharist in the tabernacle, and the Eucharist in the monstrance that's exposed? There is no difference in Christ's presence there. Christ is still just as present in the tabernacle with the door closed as he is in a monstrance with him being visible. The adoration in a monstrance that's exposed and visible is for our benefit. It helps us to pray if we can see the Eucharist in the monstrance versus trying to think of Jesus being behind the door of the tabernacle. So as to help our prayer be enhanced. It's not that Jesus is more present in the monstrous and the tabernacle. He is still there the same. It's for our benefit of why we have adoration in the monstrous. So what are the spiritual effects of receiving communion at Mass, of receiving the Eucharist into our bodies? The Eucharist, receiving Holy Communion, brings us into a profoundly intimate union with Jesus. Think about it. You are receiving his body and blood, truly, into our bodies. Jesus' presence is literally within our bodies. You can't get much more close and intimate than that. And that happens every time we receive communion, whether it's every Sunday or whether it's every day at, at weekday masses. Every time we receive the Eucharist, we are preserved. Every time we start, let me read that. When we receive communion, the Eucharist preserves, increases, and renews the life of grace that we received at baptism. When we receive the Eucharist at Holy Communion, we are separated from sin. Every time we receive the Eucharist, we are forgiven of all of our menial sins, our smaller sins. And we are strengthened from committing any mortal sins in the future. Again, that happens every time we receive communion. We are forgiven of menial sins and given strength to not commit mortal sin in the future. In addition to that, tying to that, we need to make sure we are conscious of a mortal sin in our soul to not receive communion. And the reason for this is we have to understand what mortal sin is. A mortal sin is a serious sin committed with full knowledge of its sinfulness and committed in deliberate choice. When we commit one of those sins, the life of grace dies within us. Sanctifying grace departs from our soul. And so then we are inviting Jesus into a soul that has no sanctifying grace within it. That the life of grace is dead within it. That is a sacrilege. We do not want to receive the Eucharist in that state of serious mortal sin. So the key is just if we're aware of mortal sin, try to get the confession before we go to Mass. But if that is not possible, to abstain from communion and then go to confession after that mass as soon as you can. 
So yes, the Eucharist separates us from sin and forgives our venial sins and strengthens us against committing mortal sin in the future. We need to make sure to not receive it when we know we are in mortal sin at the time. Another spiritual effect of receiving Holy Communion is that it unites us to the Catholic Church. That's why we use the word Holy Communion. Communion, union with one another. We are united to Jesus, but we are also united to the entire Church. When you list all of that together, all those spiritual effects, intimate union with Christ, being preserved, increased, and renewed of our life of grace and baptism, being separated from sin, being united to the church. The Eucharist is amazing. That's what the receiving the body and blood of Christ within us does for us. The reality of the Eucharist can be very difficult to comprehend. Because when we're at Mass, the Eucharist still looks like bread and wine. And even though we might believe in the Eucharist intellectually, we know it's his body and blood, sometimes it has trouble penetrating our hearts. Sometimes that belief in his true presence has trouble penetrating. Throughout the centuries, Jesus has performed miracles to strengthen our faith in the reality of the Eucharist in which he allows the physical qualities of his flesh and blood to actually be made visible. These are what we call Eucharistic miracles. I want to give you just one example, because there are so many of these miracles over the centuries. But I want to give you an example of one that I think is one of the most profound of these miracles. And this particular miracle happened in the 8th century in the town of Monsignor of Italy. At this time, a priest, a priest himself, was having doubts about Christ's real presence in the Eucharist. This priest was celebrating Mass one day, and after he pronounced the words of consecration, the host was changed into living flesh. The wine was changed into living blood, which then clotted into five clots. And the flesh and blood have been miraculously preserved until today for 1,200 years. In the 1970s and 1980s, two professors undertook a scientific investigation of this miracle. And here are some of their findings. These professors testified that the flesh was real, flesh and the blood was real blood, that the flesh and blood were belonging to the human species, that the flesh was made up of the muscular tissue of the heart, that the flesh and the blood had the same blood type, blood type AB, and that no preservatives were found in them that would have helped them stay intact for that long. That's what science proved about this miracle. It was real human flesh and blood. Flesh from the heart muscle. Flesh and blood that had the same blood type. And that nothing, no one put any preservatives in them. That gives me chills when I think about that. And I can't imagine what that priest was thinking when he was holding that living flesh and blood in his hands. That's the reality every time we come to Mass. Even though we can't see that, that's what is there that we cannot see. Do we believe that? You might be thinking, of course I do. But we have to ask that question. Do we really believe that that is true? The reason I ask it is because there was a study done, I believe it was last August, August of 2019, the study was done by the Pew Research Center. And the study found that among self-described Catholics, self-described Catholics being people that just identify as I'm Catholic, 
Only 31% of them say they believe that the bread and wine become the true body and blood of Christ. The other 69% said that the bread and wine were just symbols. The study then got more particular. It then found out that of most observant Catholics, the observant Catholics are Catholics who go to Mass one or more time a week. That 63% of them believed that Jesus Christ is truly present, body, blood, and soul, and divinity in the Eucharist. And that statistic seems positive, but we have to think, what's 100% minus 63? That's 37. That means 37% of Catholics who go to Mass at least once a week, if not more, don't believe in the reality of the Eucharist. That is extremely sad. Over one-third of observant Catholics don't believe in the Eucharist. As a priest, it makes my heart sad. That is very alarming. One of the core beliefs of our faith. Over a third of faithful Catholics don't believe it. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that these statistics represent St. Elizabeth Seton Parish. I'm not saying that 37% of people at Seton who don't believe in the Eucharist, that statistic is much broader. But we, based on that, I do want to say two things. If there is any of you who don't believe in the reality of the Eucharist, that the Eucharist is his body and blood, as your priest, I say to you, believe. It's true. And if this is something, this is, this is something that you are struggling with or wrestling with, I encourage you to, whenever this pandemic is over and we're allowed to be together again, to please come and talk to me. Schedule, schedule an appointment. I'd be happy to talk to you about it any time to help you with that. Secondly, for those of us who do believe in the Eucharist, I ask us, do our actions show that we believe that that's true? As human beings, the way we act and the way that we behave often reveals what we, what we believe and what we think. For example, if we believe that it's important to take care of our physical body, then our body will probably reflect that. Our body will look like it's in shape. And so if we truly believe the Eucharist is the flesh and blood of God, that God's flesh and blood come down upon that altar and that we get to receive God's body and blood, body and blood into our bodies, our actions and how we live our lives should show that that's true. And so I ask us again, do our actions show that we believe in the reality of the Eucharist? Would other people be able to recognize that we believe it's true based on how we live? At this point, I'm going to pose a series of questions to help us reflect upon this very important question. And I want you to think about each of these questions as I go through them. And if you want to hear these questions again, you can simply go back and replay this part of the video. Is Sunday Mass a priority for us? Or do we attend Sunday Mass only when it's convenient? Do we show up on time to Mass? Do we even arrive early so that we can pray beforehand? Or do we rush in, helter-skelter, and show up late? Do we put on our Sunday best dress, or are we dress like we just got out of bed? Now, a little bit different during the coronavirus pandemic, I'm talking about when we come here at Seton. Are we dressed like we truly believe that this is the Eucharist? During Mass, do we try and not focus on how long Mass is going, what time it is? Or are we so concerned that Mass has got to be an hour or less because we've got something else to go to right afterwards? 
When we receive communion, are our hearts and minds completely focused on the Eucharist, or are we distracted and thinking about what we're going to do the rest of the day? When we receive communion, do we truly receive it in our hands or on our tongue, or do we take it out of the minister's hand like it's ordinary food or like a cracker? Or do we receive it, truly receive it, not take it? After Mass is ended, do we stay in the church and offer a prayer of thanksgiving to God, or do we hurry to the gathering space and leave as soon as we can? Are we signed up for Eucharistic adoration, and if not signed up for an hour, do we at least stop at the chapel from time to time? It's open 24-7. Even during the pandemic, it's still open. Or is that adoration chapel a part of the building that we have never set foot in yet? Where are we at with all of this? Is the Eucharist a priority for us? Is the Eucharist one of the, really the most important thing of our life? Do our actions show that we believe it's God's body and blood? There is an inspiring story of a young child who, whose actions show that she believed in the Eucharist. Her name was Maria. She grew up in a poor Catholic farming family in Italy in the late 19th century and early 20th centuries. When Maria was 10 years old, it was approaching her thoughts were starting to think of receiving Holy Communion. And so she approached her mother and said, when will I make my first communion? I can no longer live without Jesus. Notice the light was there. She was only 10 years old. She hadn't even received her first communion. But she referred to the Eucharist as Jesus because she believed in reality. At this time, it was not customary for children to receive communion before age 12, so she was asking about two years, two years early. And so her mother responded, your first communion? But my child, how can you do it? You can't read. I have nothing to pay for your dress and your slippers. We have no time to spare. There's so much work to be done here on the farm. Maria pleaded, at that rate, I can never make my first communion, and I want Jesus so badly. Maria herself made a proposition to her mother. She proposed that she learn the catechism from a woman in a nearby town so that she could prepare for her first communion. Maria promised to make sure that she would get her housework and chores done early in the day so that she could go to these classes. And her mother consented to her daughter's request. So Maria, 10-year-old girl would wake up at 3 o'clock every morning to do her chores and her housework. She would then walk seven miles, one mile, probably barefoot, to attend her catechism class. After finishing the class, she would walk back to the house another seven miles, barefoot, and then finish any work at the house that remained to be done. This was her daily routine for six weeks. For six weeks every day, she'd wake up at three o'clock in the morning, do her housework, walk seven miles barefoot to, into town, attend a class on catechism, walk back barefoot seven more miles, finish up chores, and start all over again. Finally, on the Feast of Corpus Christi, which is now known as the Feast of the Body and Blood of the Lord, Maria received her First Communion with great joy. In fact, she called the day of her First Communion the happiest day of her life. After the First Communion Mass, the priest was asking all the members of her First Communion class what they had asked of Jesus when they received him in Holy Communion, what they had prayed for when they received the Eucharist. Most of the children in her class asked for things like a good home, a good marriage, 
When the priest came to Maria and asked her what she had prayed for when she received communion, she told the priest, I asked to receive Jesus in the Eucharist again. Profound. Many of you might be familiar with this little Maria. Her full name is Maria Goretti. She's a canon canonized saint of the Catholic Church. She's the patron saint of our parish, or of our sister parish in Westfield, Indiana. Shortly after this, but a year or two later, she died defending her faith at the age of 11 and is the youngest martyr of the church. We know that St. Maria Goretti truly believed in the Eucharist because the way she lived her life showed it. She walked 14 miles a day barefoot just to prepare for her first communion. I think that all of us can grow in a deeper love of the Eucharist in one way or another. So I challenge each and every one of us here today to pray to grow in love of the Eucharist, to have that same love of the Eucharist that Maria already had. That we would be doing, we willing to do whatever it takes to make the Eucharist the most important thing in our life. Because when the Eucharist is the center of our life, our lives will be changed for the better. But when the Eucharist is just one of the many side things in our lives, that's when our life will get out of whack. The Catechism says, as I mentioned in the beginning, it's the source and summit of the Christian life. The source, meaning everything comes from the Eucharist, the summit, everything is oriented towards it. Maria Gretti definitely lived that way. During this time of the coronavirus pandemic, it's been difficult to be away from the Eucharist for almost seven weeks now. I know some people who have said that they have never been away from the Eucharist for this long in their entire lives. And many people have said that their hearts are burning that their hearts are longing to receive the Eucharist again. As difficult as it may be, that burning, that longing, is a great thing, because that means that you believe in the reality of the Eucharist. If the Eucharist was not God, if it was not the body and blood of Christ, that burning, that longing would not be there. So I ask you to persevere to keep that burning, keep that longing within you, so that when you get to come back to Mass or receive the Eucharist again, whenever that may be, that your love for the Eucharist will only grow, that your love for the Eucharist will intensify, that your love for the Eucharist will be stronger after the pandemic than it was before. May God bless us all during this unique time in church history. May God continue to have our hearts burn within us to receive the Eucharist again. And when we come back, may we love the Eucharist more than we ever had before. Let's close with prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for the gift of the Eucharist, for giving us your very body and blood that is present at every Mass. We ask that during this time of quarantine, during a time in which we cannot receive the Eucharist, to allow our hearts to grow in even deeper longing for the Eucharist, that when we return, we may love the Eucharist more than we have before that our devotion to the Eucharist may intensify and grow, not just during this time of pandemic, but 
afterwards and for the rest of our lives. We ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. God bless you.